about uh, uh, academics. Yes, about ourselves. Good morning. Um, so the title may seem weird given the subject of this workshop, so I will try to motivate it. This is uh, like a, an intersection between last year's uh, subject and this year, so I hope that those of you who were here last year will appreciate the, the effort. Um, so let's start from this year. So um, what, I, uh, what I originally thought was that it was probably a good idea to talk about opinion dynamics, which I work on. That was probably spot on for this year. But then I read the, the definition of collective agency that was on the, uh, on the website of the, of the workshop. And I realized I could do something different. So if you take the first half, identifying problems, understanding them, finding solutions, that sounds pretty much like what academic research should be. That we all know it's mostly meetings and paperwork, but ideally that's what, should, what it should be. The second half, establishing consensus and implementing actions, I think has a lot to do with the question of who gets to make uh, an impact in, uh, in academic research. So, um, Taking the intersection of that with inequality that um, was the topic of last year's, um, I came up with this talk. So what I want to talk about, like I said, is uh, academic impact, which is a very broad and qualitative concept. And of course has to do with who gets to make an impact and therefore has to do with the problem of collective action, at least at the level of academic research. Obviously, very multifaceted concept, concept, operationalized mostly in terms of citation. So who gets cited, uh, and there are all sorts of bibliometric indicators derived from the citations that authors and papers receive. What's the problem, or um, maybe it's not a problem, but what's uh, an obvious observation that we can make is that citations are very unevenly distributed. This is a picture, but you, you will find thousands of them. This is a picture I took. This is a distribution of citations received by authors in, uh, in network science, and it, uh, it is well fitted by a power law with, uh, uh, with a tail exponent uh, slightly larger than two, so pretty, pretty extreme. So that means that most of the impact, most of the success, however you want to call it, is received by few people, and the vast majority of people's work doesn't get uh, a lot of attention. Why should we care if we think that this is problematic? Well, we should care because whether we like it or not, whether it's explicit or not, these numbers influence lots of, almost, almost all of the decision making in academia from who gets hired, who gets promoted, whether you're likely to get your next grant. And in some countries, you even have bonuses, salary bonuses attached to your bibliometric performance. So it matters. So in this talk, I would like to talk about three mechanisms that are conducive to uh, academic impact, and in particular, that generate inequalities in academic impact, so going back to uh, last year's workshop. So I will talk about uh, cumulative advantage, which is uh, also referred to as the phenomenon where success breeds more success, and uh, the amplification mechanisms that this generates, uh, I, this was touched upon by Thomas in his talk, for instance, the Spotify-like experiment was very much along these lines. I will talk about rankings. So when you measure people's performance or impact, it is natural to rank them. So I'll try to think about that. And then I will talk about how some of the uh, bibliometric metrics that we use are manipulated, or at least can be manipulated. So starting from a uh, cumulative advantage, what's the idea? Very simply, it's the idea that from an early small advantage, you can get uh, big differences uh, over time in success. What are the determinants of early advantages? It can be merit, of course, but it can also be random factors or uh, stuff like being in the right place at the right time, which um, is what I'll, I guess I'll talk about in the academic example I'll show. So this is probably something super familiar to, uh, to all of you or most of you, but just to you know, remind ourselves of what, uh, what um, cumulative advantage is at its core. Let's think about the very famous uh, Barabasi-Albert preferential attachment model. How does it work? There's a very small network of friends at the beginning, 
and one of them has a little bit more friends. So this, this node has five friends. This node has three. So there's a difference, but it's not huge. And there's a new node joining in and has to decide who to form a new friendship with. And what the model does, the way preferential attachment works, is that uh, this new node will, uh, with probability proportional to the number of friends they already have, will form a, a connection with, uh, with the nodes already existing in the network. So with these probabilities. And you see that the most popular node has a 33% of getting this new friend compared to a 25, 17, et cetera. So the difference is not massive. But then what happens is that if uh, the new node goes to the, uh, the node that make, forms a friendship with the node that was already the, more, the most popular, well, you see the difference, right? From 33 to 38%. So this node now has a 38% probability of getting another friend and so on and so forth. So if you let this evolve over a long time, you get, and this was shown by Barabasi and Albert in 99, you get a power law distribution in the number of contacts. So an initial small difference cascades into uh, enormous differences in success, uh, if we call success becoming a hub in this network of friends. And it can originate from random fluctuations because, of course, we could have imagined a different trajectory for our small network of friends where maybe, uh, I don't know, this uh, initially unlucky node gets a few friends at the beginning and this node becomes the hub in the long run, okay? So there are, there's plenty of real life uh, examples of this. So one of my favorites uh, has to do with, uh, I think it's called the uh, ice hockey player effect or something like that. It was first discovered with uh, professional ice hockey players. If you look at the distribution of the months that they were born in, it's not uniform as you would expect, uh, but at least in Canada where I think this was shown, uh, there's an overrepresentation of the first few years of uh, first few months of the year. Why is that? It is, it's because players start playing as little kids. So if you're born in January and there's another kid born in December, it's a massive difference at that age and that cascades. And you find that in lots of junior sports leagues, you find this overrepresentation of kids born in the first few months of the year. Similarly, if you look at tenured professors in economics departments, but I think it has been shown in um, in different disciplines, you find an overrepresentation of uh, professors with, um, whose last name begins with uh, letters at the beginning of the alphabet. And that's due to the fact that in economics, you, um, you order authors based on names, so you tend to hear more the names of first authors and so on and so forth. And that, again, cascades uh, over a very long time. So this is already uh, an academic example, but let's come to uh, the actual academic example I wanted to show you. This is an analysis that we performed uh, over the careers of more than 22,000 scientists that had long-lived careers. This is important because these are all survivors. You know that lots of people leave academia for all sorts of reasons. Here I'm only studying the, the survivors. In four uh, STEM disciplines, so these are people who had <coughs> over 20 years of publication history. And I'm gonna use two definitions that are just, you know, uh, shortcuts uh, that I do not necessarily agree with, but just to simplify things, I'm gonna call a junior researcher someone in the first few years of their career, three, five years, doesn't really matter for what I'm going to show. And top scientist is gonna be someone who's, uh, who in a given year is in the top 5% of cited authors in their field. Again, a definition that I don't necessarily like, but you see what I mean. So here in this plot, I'm showing what is the probability that one of our um, junior researchers becomes a top scientist themselves 20 years down the line, depending on one thing, basically, which is whether they co-authored a paper in the first three or five years of their career with a top cited scientist in their field. So whether they did it zero times, once, or more than once. And uh, we are grouping, uh, this is like pulling all the authors together in our data set and sorting them based on a score of institutional prestige. So the, the gray line is the probability uh, that, um, let's say the unconditional probability, or I should say the probability conditional only, of you, only on you surviving. So just by surviving uh, academia, you have uh, more than 20% probability of becoming 
uh, highly cited in, in your field, apparently. And then what you can see is that regardless of the, let's say, the, the percentiles of institutional prestige, as you would expect, those who co-author paper with prominent people in their field once or more than once have a higher chance of, of becoming um, highly cited themselves. This is very coarse-grained, so we did this in a, uh, in a much more refined way. Sure. I would say well cited. But is that what that means? Sorry. But yes. So you... basically, deliberately, we avoided um, any distinction between supervisors or this is, we just look at whether you wrote a paper with someone who's highly cited, and we removed papers with m too many authors, essentially, just to, uh, that was an obvious source of noise. But that's the only, the only thing we're looking at here. Um, so we did this uh, in a less coarse-grained way using uh, pair-matched uh, analysis, which basically tries to find two almost identical twins that differ uh, on just one variable. It's similar to what you would do to form groups for a clinical uh, trial. So you want to form a treatment group, so and you give them like the, the vaccine or whatever, and a control group, and you give them the placebo. And you want these groups to be similar, right? So you don't want just to you know, allocate, say, all the smokers by accident to the treatment group, for example. So you want to find people with similar characteristics. So here we did pretty much the same. So we found pairs of junior researchers with very similar profiles at the beginning of their career that differed only on the, uh, the feature that interested us, so whether they had or didn't have that one paper with uh, a top-cited si top scientist in their field. I'm not, I'm not gonna show you the results of this analysis. It would be a huge table with numbers that is not great for a presentation, but I'll show you this plot which basically gives you the the, the gist of it. So here we are grouping all of our junior researchers into mutually uh, exclusive groups. IPC here means whether you are in the top X percent, where I think X is 10, at the beginning of your career in terms of institutional prestige, productivity, or, or impact citations. So if you look at the IPC group, so those are the early career researchers that start the career in the best possible way, and you see that there's basically no difference for them. So the the brown and, uh, and purple refer to those who have and don't have that, that one paper with a, with, a top with a top scientist. And here on the y-axis, we have the probability of our junior researchers becoming top scientists 20 years later. And as you see, if you start your career in the best possible way, having that paper or not doesn't really make a difference to you. And the probability is pretty high. And if you go down the line to the none group, so those are not in the top percentiles uh, of any of the three dimensions. So the probability is low, but the relative difference is huge. So your chances of making it to the top almost double uh, based on whether you do uh, have that paper uh, or not. And obviously this is the, uh, by far the most numerous group by, by design. So, sure. Sorry? Number of papers. You define being top author as being in the top five percentiles, right? So how is like 25% of people, 20% of people get to the top percentile? Because they're survivors. So that's computed from the total pool of research. That's from the total pool of research. Okay, yes. That's not from just the data sets. The no, top no, 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 no. Okay, no, no. I see. Okay, no, that, okay. That no, no, I, I mentioned it. So just by, just by surviving, your chances are, are pretty high. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, so this was an example of cumulative advantage. Now let's move on to rankings, which are a natural thing to do if you accept this view that there should be a number that tells, or a set of numbers that tells us something about you know, how people perform. And rankings are great, if you wish, because they simplify potentially very complex systems into ordered lists. What's the problem here is that if you create a ranking, people will always 
try to climb it. That's just how humans are. So again, let's start from a very simple model. This was uh, work with, with Matteo. This is uh, a simple model that we called the social climbing game. So it, this is literally what's, what's happening. So the, the nodes in this network are trying to climb the ranks by having more and more friends. So the way it works is that, let's say this blue node has just uh, one friend and is obviously not happy. Uh, what this guy wants to do is to form friendships with nodes that have lots of friends. So they, nodes here want to be in touch with nodes that are very popular. So the way it works is that this uh, blue node through his friend meets this other node which is very popular and highly connected. So the blue node will cut its link to the uh, less popular node and form a link with the more popular node. And this works uh, through a parameter that tells us the, the probability of these events happening. So essentially it quantifies the intensity of this process. So how much the nodes care about climbing the ranking. So if you don't care much, uh, that may mean that you value your friendship with this uh, unpopular node because of whatever reason, you watch games together something or something like that. Whereas if you just, just care about climbing the ranking, you will do this thing all the time. Excuse me. And the rule is that you can only do that when there is one. Yes, <coughs> you meet new nodes through. Uh, through only one connection. Yes. You have to. So what happens is that as a function of this parameter that quantifies how much nodes care about climbing the ranking, we see uh, a, literally a phase transition. So um, when the effort to climb the ranking is low, the network is pretty much democratic. So um, everyone has roughly the same. Uh, degree, whereas when the uh, efforts to climb the ranking are high, we see something like this. So the emergence of, uh, of hubs that dominate the network and are connected to everyone. And I should stress that, of course, there's nothing special about uh, this node here. It's just, again, this is an example of success emerging out of random fluctuations. We can study this model a bit, uh, a bit more. Uh, Beta here is this parameter that quantifies the intensity of, um, let's say, of these uh, social, social climbing dynamics, which in physics would be an inverse temperature. And we can study how mobility in, in the rankings evolves as we change these parameters. So when the parameter is low, uh, you can look at the blue band. So here we are plotting as a function of your position in the ranking, so Q here means where you are, so zero means you are at the bottom, one means you are at the top. We plot delta Q, which is how much you have uh, climbed the ranking up or down over a certain amount of time. And you see that when this parameter is low, there's a lot of mobility. So if you start at the top, uh, you, you can only go down. If you start at the bottom, there is upwards mobility. And if you are in the middle where Q is 0.5, there's a 50-50 chance that you will go up or down. If we increase this intensity, so people start caring more and more uh, about uh, the hierarchy, about the ranking, the ranking more or less freezes at least at the bottom and at the top. So you see the red dots at the bottom are stuck. So if you end up at the bottom of the ranking, you stay there. If you are at the top, there's tiny mobility, but you, you stay there. And the only mobility that survives is somewhere in, in the middle. So, Essentially, this simple model makes two qualitative predictions. One, that when people care a lot about rankings, we should see um, a freezing at the top and at the bottom of a ranking, and that there should be an inverse relationship between mobility and inequality. So the more uh, unequal um, some, some notion of society becomes, the less mobile it becomes, and vice versa. So let's see if we find the same phenomena in academia. So this is a study with uh, way more uh, scientists. This is 5 million people uh, in 57 disciplines. Again, just survivors, so people with long-lived uh, careers. And we um, split them into annual cohorts. So the idea is we take all the people who started their career in a field, say, in 2020, watch them evolve over 10 years, and see how they did from the first five years to the second five years ranked based on the citations they got. So the, this is chemistry, but every STEM discipline at least looks pretty much the same. So the matrix on the left is uh, a transition um, 
matrix essentially. So we split the ranking into deciles and compute the empirical probability that if you are in a certain decile, you will move uh, up or down uh, over the, the following five years. And we try to calibrate a simple random, random walk model on this, uh, meaning you, you move with a certain diffusion coefficient that we calibrated on the data. And the, the middle plot is the one you get uh, in, for chemistry in this example after this calibration. And what we found is that basically the random walk model is pretty good at explaining everything except the top and the bottom. So the difference between the two is the third plot and you see the big red um, squares uh, telling us that a random walk model that tells us, well, you will tend to stay where you are or move slightly upwards or downwards explains 80% of the mobility essentially, except for the top and bottom that are frozen, just like in the, uh, in the, in the social climbing game. So uh, here is a plot show where um, each dot is a discipline uh, in a given uh, year, uh, actually a cohort, I should say. And here we are plotting this, um, let's say, diffusion coefficient on the x-axis, which quantifies how much you can move in this field. So the higher, the more you can move up or down um, the ranking. And on the y-axis, we have the Gini coefficient of citations, so a measure of inequality. And we find this inverse relationship that uh, we also saw in the, in the social climbing game. Uh, we pushed this even further and produced what in economics is called the Great Gatsby Curve uh, from the famous novel, which is also about, uh, I guess, um, mobility. So the idea of the Great Gatsby Curve is you take a country and you study the relationship between uh, its social mobility and its intergenerational persistence, which means uh, how much your economic well-being and status depend uh, on those of your parents. We did the academic equivalent. So here, intergenerational persistence means how much your academic impact depends on that of, of, of your uh, supervisors. And in this case, we used a data set called uh, Academic Tree, if I'm not mistaken, which provides pairs of um, students, supervisors of different kinds, so including postdocs, et cetera. And as you would expect, you find the equivalent of the Great Gatsby Curve. So this looks different because we're using different dimensions. But again, you find this relationship between inequality and mobility, which here is shown as immobility, so the lack of it, also called intergenerational persistence. And so you see that um, the more a discipline is unequal, so the more citations are concentrated in the hands of um, fewer scientists, the more you see this phenomenon of uh, intergenerational persistence. So your academic success de depends more on, uh, of, on that of your, uh, let's say, uh, academic parents, so to speak. Finally, the um, third thing I wanted to talk about is the manipulation of metrics. Uh, this is. Yeah, of course. Um, so what were the, what was the highest and lowest? What's that purple dot? Um, I never Which remember. Was the most, uh, so the this so the purple dot here is uh, sociology. This one here is philosophy. So sociology is the most unequal. Sociology is the least unequal. So sociology is the least unequal, and the one where the okay. your success depends the least on okay. on that of your yeah. Mm. And given that, so there's number of physicists, let's see. Uh, yeah, it's some, yeah, physics is somewhere in the middle. Um, yeah, uh, third and final thing, manipulation of metrics. So again, if you buy into this idea of measuring uh, someone's performance or an academic's performance based on indicators, then these should be reliable. What's the problem is that as it's always the case, when we know that our performance is being evaluated, we change our behavior. And we see evidence of that in, in academia. This is interesting. Uh, this is an example from Italy, which uh, I think in 2010 institutionalized the use of bibliometric indicators. So in Italy, to become associate or full professor you, in, in your field, you have to have uh, a set of numbers that are higher than certain thresholds that depend on the field. 
and this was done in 2010, what was the response of the system and increasing the rate of self-citations, as you would expect. And this is uh, very well, uh, goes very well with the uh, adage known as Goodhart's Law, which states that when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. So this is obvious, this is self-citation. A few years ago, we tried to look for the, let's say, the next order effect, which is uh, reciprocity. So we tried to see whether there was evidence of pairs of authors exchanging citations at a higher rate than you would expect. There's a lot of detail here that I don't have time to uh, unpack because of course this is not just a naive measurement of numbers of citations exchanged. This is done with respect to a null model that incorporates the fact that of course people who work closely will cite each other, uh, that people in the same field will cite each other, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Happy to talk about it more, but let's say, let's assume that my model is perfect. This is a measure of excess reciprocity. So zero means everything is in line with the benchmark. And what we see is that over 40 years, we, we see this uh, increase almost linearly, and then it, it stabilized uh, around the 90s. I don't really have a good explanation for that plateau, but this is what we saw, and at least there's pretty much obvious evidence that something has been going on more and more over the years. And the last thing I wanted to show you is the phenomenon of so-called citation cartels. This has to do with journals, not people. So of course journals have an incentive to boost their um, citation numbers because that boosts the impact factor. And over the years, uh, institutions such as Thomson Reuters have banned um, certain journals, mostly predatory journals, for, um, for similar practices, so for evidence of uh, an ex excessive exchange of uh, citations. So again, here we came up with uh, an algorithm, which I don't have time to explain in detail, that again, starting from a null model, which takes into account communities, so the fact that, of course, um, let's say, journals in physics should exchange citations at a very high rate, so discounting all of that looks for uh, an ex excessive rates of citations within groups and uh, identifies candidates for citation cartels. And there is a small ground truth data set provided by these Thomson Reuters bands. And what we found was that our algorithm was able to identify a couple of years in advance in many cases the journals that would eventually be banned by Thomson Reuters. Um, so there's a whole zoo of, uh, let's say, uh, a taxonomy of citation cartels. We found about 180 over the time span of uh, our analysis. I think the most effective way is to show you a couple of examples. So this is an example. Uh, what I forgot to mention is that the algorithm identifies journals that are um, donors, recipients, or both. So a donor journal, journal is a journal that gives citations to the other journals in the group, a recipient obviously receives them, and some journals act as both. So this is um, an example in the humanities, I think, where we see, for instance, a donor paper that uh, from a single journal that contributes, that basically accounts for 57% of the impact factors of all the journals in the group. And if you look at that paper, it's 42 pages long and 40 of them are bibliography. And then there's uh, another example, and this is uh, the work of a single person uh, who basically wrote, this is in engineering, I think, wrote basically a third of the papers that provide within group uh, citations, self-cited their work more than 300 times. And then we, uh, we, we checked manually the editorial boards of the journals that we could find, and this was one of those cases. And this person would happen to be on the editorial board of a journal that acts both as a donor and as a recipient in the, in the group. So I hope that this conveys the message. So that's it from me. Uh, I just wanted to um, provide some examples. Um, it should be pretty obvious that I'm not endorsing the use of citations and bibliometric indicators as a good idea but this is the reality we live in, in, in academia. So this was just, I, I hope, an opportunity to reflect about the, some of the consequences by looking at cumulative advantage phenomena, uh, by looking at what happens when you rank uh, academics, and by looking at, let's say, the unintended consequences, uh, such as uh, manipulation phenomena, uh, et cetera. 
Um, I want to jump on the bandwagon of, I have a book. It has nothing to do with what I've talked about today. <laughs> it's about random matrices, pretty abstract concept, but don't buy it. It's on the archive. Don't give money to Springer in case you, and yeah, just wanted to thank the collaborators and funders of this research. Thank you very much. Thank you, Giacomo, for the beautiful talk. Um, so questions now. Uh, just a real quick one. So you mentioned that you can kind of predict which journals might be excluded later. Are you in contact with them to like help them? I mean, you should um, use a data source. That's a, that's a very good point. No, we did this obviously in, in retrospect. Uh, and the problem is that sometimes, uh, if you want to do this ground truth analysis, sometimes you can't because um, after Thomson Reuters uh, bans uh, the, the journals, there's, um, um, there's a lot of papers withdrawn. So the, the papers that drive this phenomenon are, are withdrawn. So we were happy to, to see that we could identify in advance, but of course in, in, in advance, but in the past, some of these groups. Uh, but so you must have identified some that you think should be banned that they haven't. Um, I must confess we haven't checked much, at, uh, looked much at the future. Um, the thing is, obviously, you, you don't find, um, I don't know, you, you're never going to find nature in, the, in those. So the, the journals in there are pretty much predatory journals. And uh, by now, I think, you, you, you know one when you see one, I guess. But um, at least I, I thought it was interesting to see how this takes place, and there's, like I said, there's a whole taxonomy, and uh, I guess that may help uh, people recognize uh, this phenomenon when they are taking place, so before it's too late. Great, that was really cool. I really enjoyed <laughs> that. Um, Thank you. So I, I had a question about funding, basically. So, so that lots of articles have suggested that the amount of time people spend writing, you know, grants and things like that, is is not paid back by the system effectively, so people make less than minimum wage and this kind of thing, plus there are all these biases within funding. And so I wondered if you looked at all at funding and these type of outcomes. No, I, I have a paper about funding, but um, on a completely unrelated research question, so um, it's actually a good message for this crowd, which is that uh, interdisciplinary scientists who survive then get have a better track record at attracting funding than non-interdisciplinary ones. But um, yeah, uh, that was done with uh, the research councils in the UK, and that's, um, that's a pretty rare combination because they, uh, they, are, they are very well structured, they give money, and you can get the data. Um, but no, to answer your question, no, we haven't looked at those biases yet. Thank you for a great talk. I wanted to go to the first part and um, maybe play devil's advocate. So if somebody is highly cited and the system isn't entirely broken, then there should be also a good reason for that, right? Because they're good scientists. And so if, I, if I'm trained by a good scientist, you know, <laughs> I have a good chance of becoming a good scientist myself. Absolutely. So I think what I'm asking is, can you build a the null model, not the random walk, but there should be something about, you know, the scientific quality of the education I get, the supervisor I have. Absolutely, no, no, you're one hundred percent right. The, separate that from the it, actual. It's very difficult. Uh, we we thought about it, and what I didn't say but should have said, is that oops. Um, um, so I guess the the message here is, uh, if we go back to the metaphor of the two twins. The problem is not the, let's say, the, the lucky twin. I think the problem is the unlucky one. Uh, this was to show that we are probably by, let's say, by ranking people this way and thinking about academic success this way, we're missing out on a lot of people that start as good as their uh, luckier peers, but then don't get enough recognition. So obviously, there's no problem with, like, like you said correctly, I, I have no problem with, uh, with this person, whoever that may be. I think that the problem is 
the other one. Thank you. And yeah, I, maybe one thing um, in in the case in the last case um, <clears throat> in the in two slides from this one uh, in the um, in the rightmost column there this maybe one. you have. Uh, Maybe not the supervisor, but the institution you're in is, is a good institution. And indeed there, the, there is no difference, right? So maybe yes. this goes a bit in that direction as a null um, yes. somehow, maybe. But th that was really indeed a good point. <clears throat> so I, I was wondering if you looked at the, so this is all, I understand this is all from the sort of the scientists that are present in the data set throughout the end. But what's, you, did you look at the survival? Did you look at you know, the probability of um, staying in the data set? We, we did. I, I don't remember the, the, the numbers. Uh, but yeah, of course, the, the vast majority. Uh, we, we did when we looked at this um, much larger data set. This was uh, Web of Science. Um, clearly, the, the I don't know if it's the majority, but a very big chunk of people just are there for a single paper and then disappear. Right. And there's all sorts of explanation. It may even be, I don't know, someone, someone from industry that writes a paper with academics. So there's lots and lots of possible explanations. Uh, we really didn't have, um, like, I don't know, a good idea on how to deal with that, uh, at least for this analysis, which is why we decide, okay, let's just look at the survivors at least we remove that. Right. I mean, I, I, I'm asking time. because I, I since in some sense, you know, if you survive for 20 years, and this is 22 years. Um, no, this is, um, I mean, long-lived careers here means 20, but this is, yeah, people right. starting their career. So the, the first career year is between 86 and 2008. Oh, I so see. So it's slightly different. But. Right, right. Okay, yeah. So, um, but yeah, if, if, you, if you stay in the business for like 20 years, you're already successful, right? Like, so everybody is successful. So, so in some sense, focusing on the like top 5% of that is like, even, like focusing on the top of the top, right? In True, some ways, but right? So, as you would imagine, uh, the reviewers asked uh, for all the robustness. Right. As long as you, you know, don't, don't call the top 80% the top, uh, it's still there. The, the effect is, is, is still there. Um, right, yeah. But I, I, I'm just saying. But, but I, Point taken, in, terms of, in terms of like losing potential and that sort of thing, and I, which is also kind of a loaded thing, especially like in science, there's a lot of like, you know, leaving academic science is not a failure. In other words, no, right? no, no, absolutely. But, but 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 if you're thinking about like how how do we include most people in the, in academic science, right? Like that's probably like the the, the severest selection step is like staying in the, in the business, right? Yeah. No, of course we we would have loved to like repeat these analysis with survival as the dependent variable, but the problem is you have no idea about the, the causes. I mean, there's some people obviously choose to leave academia. And okay, thanks. Uh, it's time for a coffee break, and but we meet again at 11.10, given that we were a bit, uh, we went a bit long. Thanks, you.